that, I, uh, that I'm currently doing, uh, we draw against an employee kidnapped at the University of Washington. And let me start by warning you that this is very much work in progress. Uh, we really don't have all that much in the way of results yet, just a little bit. Uh, so think of this talk more of as like a speculative uh, talk with, with ideas uh, for your consideration and some preliminary evidence uh, that they're interesting. Right? Maybe it's not ready yet, but the topic was such a perfect match to this conference that, that I just couldn't resist. Okay? And on that note, this is the fanciest slide in the whole talk. Okay? All right, so uh, here's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, first, I will uh, begin by disappearing from the camera uh, with, with a little bit of motivation and then a very brief uh, intro on symmetry group theory, which is the main thing that we're going to be using here. And then, uh, so I'm going to suggest this uh, new set of algorithms uh, for learning based on symmetry group theory. And, and we will look at two uh, particular applications. Uh, one, uh, deep symmetry networks for uh, um, uh, object recognition. And another one, uh, symmetry-based semantic parsing. Okay? And as time allows, I will uh, conclude with, with a little bit of discussion. So here's the motivation in, in two parts. The first part, which I don't think needs to be delivered for this audience, is that learning representations is the central problem in machine learning. If we can't solve it, we can't solve learning, and if we solve it, we're, we're uh, or the, you know, as much as we can solve it, uh, we're, we're well on our way. The second part, however, I think uh, might be somewhat uh, less uh, obvious, which is that uh, symmetry group theory, I believe, or I have come to believe, is a natural foundation for learning representations. We can, we can perhaps get a lot of mileage out, out of applying it to this problem. And in a way, you can, you can look at the talk as to follow us as an argument towards this end, which you may or, or may not agree with. So uh, let me start with a very brief uh, tutorial on symmetry group theory. Many of you probably already know this, but it, but it's, it's, it sets the stage for, uh, for what's to follow. And the best place to start is probably geometry, where it's simplest and most intuitive. So a sim what is the symmetry of an object? The symmetry of an object is a very natural and obvious thing. It's a transformation that maps the object to itself. Like, for example, a square has eight symmetries, rotations of 0, 90, 180, and 270 degrees, and reflections on the four axes shown in this picture. Okay? And these symmetries have the very nice property that they can be composed, yielding more of symmetries from the same set. So, for example, composing a 90 with a 180 degree rotation gives a 270 degree. Composing two reflections gives a, a, a rotation, and so on and so forth. Okay? There's an identity symmetry which is rotating by zero degrees that leaves the object, in this case the square, the same. Okay? Each symmetry has an inverse. I can reflect again in the same plane or, or rotate by the same you know, amount in the opposite direction. And, and the composition of symmetries is associated. Okay? Which means that symmetries uh, satisfy the group axioms, right? Uh, what are the group axioms? Uh, a group is a set and the binary operation uh, dot on it with four properties, closure, identity, inverses, and associativity. Closure just means that whichever two elements I combine with the operator, the result is still in the set. Uh, identity just means that there's a special element that combined with any other element x gives that element x. Uh, inverses just means that every element has another one that combined with it gives the identity, and associativity just means that I can associate things and whatever. Okay. So very straightforward, many, many things that we are uh, familiar with are, are, are groups, like for example the reals uh, with addition form a group and so on. But, in symmetry, but, but symmetry groups are a more interesting thing. Right? In symmetry groups what happens is that the group elements themselves are functions. <laughs> So the things that I'm combining are not objects with a function, but functions with function composition. So the group operation is function composition. And this is part of what makes it powerful, is that we're working at a higher level than the more traditional groups. Okay? And this is really what we're, what we're going to be using here. Okay? Now the square, uh, the group of symmetries of a square is discrete. <coughs> of course, we can also have continuous groups. They are called Lie groups in honor of the, of the mathematician Sophus Lee, uh, the, who invented them. Um, and you know, a, a simple example of a continuous symmetry loop is the symmetries of a circle, right? I can rotate a circle through any degree, and I can reflect the circle on any diameter, and it's, and it's still the same circle, okay? 
Now, uh, these symmetries are, are interesting, but really what we're after here is something quite different. And the first step towards that is this one very well-known uh, leak group, which is the symmetries of Euclidean space, also known as the Euclidean group. These are symmetries that, these are transformations of the Euclidean split space, think of the Euclidean plane, for example, that preserve the distance between any pair of points. Okay, so I map the plane, let's say, to a new plane, but the distance between any pair of points is preserved. And this includes all translations, rotations, and rotations. Okay? Now, here's the more general uh, notion of symmetry, or at least one way of putting it, that's the one that we're really uh, interested in here. This is the notion that the symmetry of a function, and now we're going to talk about symmetries of functions, no longer just symmetries of objects. The symmetry of a function is a change in the input that doesn't change the output. Okay? We can also think of it as a symmetry of the, chain, of the input itself, but either way it works, and this one is, 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 is more natural for us. Okay? So here's an object x, here's, here's a function f of x, okay? and, the, and, and, and what I'm saying is that a symmetry of a function of the function f is another function that I apply before f, f, let's call it s for symmetry, and what I'm saying is that if I apply s and then f, I get the same result as if I just apply f. Okay? So this is, this is the general notion of, of symmetry that we're interested in here. And under this general guy, symmetry is one of the most powerful, most widely used concepts in, in all of mathematics. Uh, in, in particular, mathematics itself is rife with applications of symmetry. All the way from solving polynomial equations, where, you know, this, where a lot of this started, to solving differential equations, to a lot of proofs that actually use symmetry as their key step, like the proof of the minimax theorem, for example, and, and so on. Uh, symmetry is... Uh, Perhaps, so symmetry is not only perhaps the most you know, widely used and, and, and highly developed area of modern mathematics, it also dominates modern physics. So in physics, the function that we're interested in is the Lagrangian, which is the difference between the kinetic and the potential energies of the system. It completely describes the system, and moreover, all the major laws of physics are symmetries of the Lagrangian. Conservation of momentum and energy, special and general relativity, uh, you know, the, the, the standard model of particle physics and some of the newer, more speculative theories like string theory and as an implies supersymmetry all arise as symmetries. So symmetry really is, is, is central in physics today. But, but coming closer to the things that we're interested in, symmetry has also seen a lot of uses in optimization and search. One of the uses of, of, of symmetry in search is that it can vastly reduce the size of the first search space by, by noticing that different states are really the same. Like, for example, if you're trying to play tic-tac-toe, it doesn't matter if you rotate the, uh, uh, you know, the, the tic-tac-toe board by, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, 180 degrees, you get the same thing again. And therefore, you can do much less search. Right? And again, in optimization, there are similar applications in model checking. In vision, symmetry has made a number of appearances, including most uh, recently in uh, Tommy Poggio's theory. Of the uh, um, you know of the of the ventral sprue uh, in, in in the cortex, uh, it's also found some interesting applications in uh, lifted probabilistic inference, which is actually how I first uh, got interested in it. If you have very large uh, models, like for example Markov logic networks that can have easily millions of nodes and billions of connections, uh, inference without exploiting symmetry is very hard. But if you notice the symmetries, but Fortunately, however, these kinds of statistical relational models have a lot of a, a lot of symmetry, and so by exploiting that symmetry, we can make the, the, the inference vastly more efficient. Okay, and so on. <coughs> now, what's a little more puzzling to me is that symmetry has not been used more widely in machine learning. Why is that? If you think back to the definition, right, the symmetry of a function is a change in the input that doesn't change the output, right? All it takes is to think of, of is to take a particular type of function, which is a classifier, right? So think of a classifier, right? What happens if the function is a classifier? Then the symmetry of the classifier is just a representation change that doesn't change the examples of the classes. Okay? So here's my function, the classifier from x to f of x. And what a symmetry is is a change of representation of the input, right, of x that preserves the class of x. So it's a change that I can make at the input that doesn't actually change the classes. 
And if you think about it this way, I think it becomes almost obvious that symmetry group theory has to have something to say about machine learning. And in particular, about representation learning. Because what is, what is the goal of representation learning at, at the end of the day? It's to get rid of unimportant variations, right? So that the, uh, the discovering the important ones becomes easier. Okay. Well, if you think about it in, in this framework, an important variation right, is the target function. Right? For example, I'm doing face recognition, and I want to be able to tell the face of my grandmother from the face of a stranger, for example. Okay? So let's say this is the important variation that I want. It's a function. I want to get rid of the unimportant variations. Well, the important, unimportant variations are symmetries of that target function. For example, I might want to you know, have pose invariants, sliding invariants, and so on and so forth. So if we can learn and then detect all or as many as possible of the symmetries of the target function and then compose them, we're almost there. Because after having done that, the problem becomes trivial. Okay. So this is the general idea that, that I'm going to be uh, talking about here. Uh, let me just sort of like make a broader case for, for using symmetry in learning. So what, what are the benefits that it might have? Well, one great benefit is that in a manner somewhat analogous to what happens in search and optimization, we can really reduce the sample complexity. Right? In search it was the time and the space, but here it's the number of samples. If I detect a lot of symmetries, what that means is that my instance space becomes a lot smaller, as a result of which I can learn more with fewer samples. Okay? And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Another, another way that symmetry uh, uh, learning might be useful is that it allows us to formulate more general versions of a lot of the algorithms that we know and love. In fact, more generally, I think using ideas from abstract algebra and machine learning is very attractive precisely because those ideas are very general. And we can, for example, have algorithms that work for many different semi-rings, which you could argue is what some prior networks are all about, or different groups without having to specify a priori which is the group to which you're going to apply it, or the semi-ring or whatever. It might lead the way to new formal results. That would be very exciting. We actually only have fairly you know, trivial ones so far, but I think there's this potential here. Here's another interesting one. Composing symmetries is potentially a really good way to do deep learning. Because every composition is effectively another layer. And at the same time, learning the, the symmetries is much easier uh, if you learn them without actually having to learn the full composition in every, in every uh, example already. Okay? So again, this is a very exciting uh, possibility, and we're going to see an example of, of, of this to some degree here. And, and finally, one thing to note is that this idea is actually orthogonal to the traditional divisions in, in, in machine learning. So we can apply ideas from symmetry group theory to connectionist models, vision ones, kernel based ones, symbolic, whatever you like. Okay. So, uh, and, and, you know, and then we'll see a couple of examples of, of, of that here, but, but, uh, uh, but, but there are many more. So, um, I said that there haven't been too many applications of, of, of symmetry uh, in machine learning. There have been some. And, however, the, 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 the single, I would say, most successful and, 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 and the important one is actually one that is not traditionally viewed as, as an application of symmetry group theory, but, but it really is, I would say, which is continents. Okay, so what, what is a continent? Right? A continent is really a stack of feature maps interspersed with pooling. Right? So I have my inputs, I have my feature maps, and then finally I have a classifier uh, sitting on top of those feature maps. Okay. And what is a feature map? A feature map is really a feature function applied at all possible translations in the image. Okay. So I take my feature, let's say it was an eye, and I slide it everywhere, and I can fit the feature in all those places. Okay. And translations are a symmetry group. Right? Translations are a very simple and limited symmetry group, but that's what they are. They satisfy the, 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 you know, the group the, you know, the, the group axioms and, and, and so forth. So this immediately suggests a very natural generalization of continents, which is instead of translations, let's just use an arbitrary symmetry group. And I'm going to call them as well deep symmetry networks because they can be deep and they're based on symmetry. And what I'm going to do here is two steps. Step one is formulate a general architecture that works for any symmetry group. So tomorrow you decide that you want to make your invariants, your, your images invariant to some new thing, or known thing, or combination of things. And you know, as long as you know what the symmetry group, or you can set up a symmetry group that does that, you should be able to, from what I'm going to describe, derive a type of deep symmetry network for those. Okay. 
And then I'm going to illustrate that with uh, one particular symmetry group, which is the affine group. Right? The affine group is the obvious next step to go to from translations. Uh, uh, it, it, what is the affine group? It's all linear transformations of the input. Okay? So in particular, it's going to include all translations, rotations, reflections, and scale. So here's the affine transformation on the plane, which is what we're going to be interested in, is that like x, x, y are going to become x prime, y prime, and x prime, y prime is a 2 by 2 matrix times x, y plus these offsets. Okay, so these guys take care of the translation, and these guys take care of everything else. Okay, okay so this is what we're going to uh, um, do here. So um, before we do it, however, there's one more concept that we need from, from symmetry group theory, and this is the concept of the generating set. So what is a generating set? Let's suppose that G is a group and S is a subset of that group. We say that S is a generating set of G if every element of G can be expressed as a combination of elements of S and their inverses. Okay? And usually a group has many different generating sets, but we're typically interested in some kind of minimal generating set that has as few elements as possible, and where the elements in some sense represent small transformations. And a simple example of this is translation, right? So here's a generating set for translation. It's to add one transformation is to add epsilon to x. So it's a small shift uh, in the x direction. And, and another one is a small shift in the y direction. And the inverses would be minus epsilon, taking the shift to the left instead of the right, and so on. And you can compose this, obviously, to obtain uh, any translation. Okay? And we need also a notion of neighborhood in, uh, uh, in, 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 the, um, in the space of symmetries. And so let's define it as follows. The k-neighborhood of a function in G under S is the subset of elements of G that can be expressed as F composed with at most, with elements of S at most k times. Okay? So for example, in the case of translation, let's say that, you know, that this is my F, this is a particular translation in the X direction, and all I can do is add you know, a certain fixed number of, of more epsilon translations in the X and Y direction. Okay? And this, in our case, gives us a diamond, which is not the traditional rectangle, but it would be easy to extend that, you know, with different limits for the two uh, operations, you know, but this is good enough for our purposes. Okay. So we have a notion of a generating set, and we have a notion of neighborhood in symmetry space. Okay. So here's the general uh, architecture. It's very simple. It's just like this. Uh, you build one layer of your, of your deep symmetry network as follows. You take your input. You apply every symmetry in the group to it, and then, right, you compute, you just compute your features, right, the features that are going to form your feature map on the transformed input. So input, symmetry, feature, for all symmetries and all features. And then I pull over neighborhoods as defined on the previous slide. Okay. So, uh, and then, so this is one layer. And then, uh, um, you know, to build a network with many layers, I just repeat this. And I can train this using background. Okay? If the symmetries are continuous, right, I can just train this using background. Okay? Now, this idea by itself is not that new, right? People have thought of applying a fine uh, transformation. Right? But I think there are, there are the, this, like I said, this is only a first step. We'll, we'll see more in, in, in a little bit. But I think when people have thought of applying this, um, there were a couple of difficulties that they ran into. One was that uh, adding rotations, for example, and, and reflections didn't seem to add that much power. Right? We're going to defer on that one you know, a, a little bit, but we'll come back to it. But the other one is that, of course, well, uh, this is all very nice, but, but how is it going to scale? Right? So let's see, first of all, how we apply this to uh, the affine transformation, okay? and then how we're going to scale this. Right? And, and you know, and we could call the result, you know, deep affine network. So what's what's going to happen is that one layer is just apply every affine transformation to the image plane. Okay, you can think of the transformations as being applied to the window, right? I can not only translate it but also rotate it and scale it and and, and, and reflect it and so forth. Or you can think of it as keeping the window fixed and just uh, because the, you know convolution is commutative, right? I can translate or scale or, or rotate or reflect the image plane itself. Okay. So let's say we pick the latter, right? So what we do is we apply every possible affine transformation to the image plane, right? Every one of those linear transformations, right? And then we compute features on the transformed plane, right? So what's going to happen in my window is that depending on the symmetry, I'm going to have a different picture in that window, but I'm going to apply the feature, you know, 
with that window in every possible set of circumstances. And then I pull over neighborhoods in that fine space, okay, in the way that I define it. Okay. So a neighborhood in that fine space is going to be a certain you know, amount of translation, rotation, etc., you know, up, up to some limit. And then I can stack layers of this, and then I can train by backdrop. Okay. The generating set for the, or a generating set for, for f on space can just be the identity matrix. You know, like you take that entry matrix from the origin and you add epsilon to every parameter. Right? So we already saw how to do this for translation, right? But for the others, what you have is you have the identity matrix, and you know, I can add, and I can add one to add epsilon to one, right? One plus epsilon zero, zero, one. Or I can add epsilon to the zero and so on and so forth. And by obviously by composing this, I can get all, all possible. So that's the generating set of this case. All right, so very nice, but how, how, how can we actually make this thing, right? Because obviously now we have a big problem, which is we are now in a 6D space instead of a 2D one. And you know, if you have a, a 100 by 100 image, this means that you have to you know, evaluate your features at 10,000 locations, which is not great, but it's you know, just about doable. However, once you go to 6D, right, if again you have this 100, you know, Options for every uh, you know uh, for every epsilon you know like you can do up to 100 times epsilon you have a trillion symmetries. So obviously that's not going to scale. So what do we do then? Well, again, there's I think a simple solution that that suggests itself, which is that uh, we don't need to compute the features everywhere. Right? We can compute them only for some symmetries and then interpolate for the rest. I mean, you know, we do machine learning. This is, this is the kind of stuff that we do for a living. By that standard, being in 60 space is not even that big of a deal. You know, 60 is, is low. Of course, our goal at the end of the day is to have not just six symmetries, but you know, hundreds or even thousands of symmetries. At, at, at which point, doing this is going to be you know even more uh, essential. Okay. So, where should we compute the features, right, in order to get the best possible approximation? Well, the key thing to realize is that we are not equally interested in these features everywhere. What we really care about is, is the values of the symmetries that will lead to the maximum of the features, because that's where we're likely to be, you know, detecting, say, a person, you know, at this scale and, you know, in this orientation and so forth. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is, is the control points for the, for the interpolation are going to be local maxima, hopefully all of them, or as many as possible, of the feature. Okay. So what we do is the following. We pick n random starting points. And by the way, the complexity of this is really just to be controlled by n. It's going to be independent of the dimensions. So I can have as many dimensions as I want, provided I have a fixed number of control points. Of course, the quality might degrade, but, but, or, or, or not, right? So I pick n random starting points, and then I, find, and then I let each one converge to a local maximum by gradient descent. Okay? And for those of you familiar with Lucas Kennard, what we're actually doing here is applying the affine generalization of Lucas Kennard everywhere in the network, right? So you can summarize what I've been talking about so far as continents with Lucas Kennard embedded in you know, all lots of different, in you know, all sorts of different orientations and scales in each layer and then the location of, of the network. Okay? So we find this local maxima, and then we just you know use interpolation, and in particular we use you know Gaussian kernels for interpolation. I can imagine using something else, but this is this is an obvious thing. Okay. And notice that now, in order to do pooling, all that you need to do is widen the kernel. Okay, the more you widen the kernel, the more pooling you do, because the kernel is actually averaging over a region of this feature map. Okay? So there actually, there's not, nothing additional involved uh, uh, in, in, in doing this. And, and, and you know, I can, for example, make the width of the kernel increase as I go up the layers and you know, play with it in, in various ways. Now, in order for this to be feasible, we still need <coughs> a data structure that allows us to very quickly, for every uh, point in symmetry space, as we do the gradient descent, find the nearest neighbors, because those, the nearest neighbors are among the control points, because those are the ones that are going to control the value of the function at that point. And for that, we use ball trees. Okay. Ball trees, uh, you may not be familiar with them, or you may be, they're similar to KD trees, right? They're an efficient data structure for retrieving your neighbors, but they have, but they're much better, they're more scalable, and they have the important feature they actually do not depend on the number of dimensions. The KD trees, you know, like become very inefficient with high dimensions, uh, um, ball trees not so much. Although, you know, in the end, the cursor dimensionality will go to one or another. Okay? 
So this is basically what we have done. Uh, here is our very preliminary experiment. Right? So here's what we did. Again, we did something fairly obvious. We took the MNIST rotated data set, which consists of the MNIST digits rotated to all possible angles. And then we fed them to a one-layer continent and a one-layer symmetry net. Okay? So our goal here, I mean, ultimately, of course, it is to, to improve the state of the art. But so far, right, it's just to demonstrate that this idea has promise. And so here's what happens. So, so we take the continent, you know, uh, the piano implementation, play the usual parameters. And then what we do for the symmetry network is just, we just replace, you know, the, the layer, right, before the classifier with, with the sin net. And here's what we get. So we have we have 10,000 training examples, 2,000 for validation, 50,000 for testing. And here's what happens. With fewer training examples, the SIMNET has a huge advantage. As we get more and more examples, you know, the, 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 the error of both of them goes down, obviously, but the error of the content goes down by more. But the interesting thing to notice here is that when we're in a sparse situation, as we will be when we go to more realistic problems, uh, the SIMNET actually has a very large advantage. And this is not surprising because it can actually be invariant with respect to all those rotations. Whereas the quantum net is actually trying to understand those rotations as translations, which they really aren't. Another, another interesting thing that happened here was that one of the parameters that we varied was the, was the, <coughs> excuse me, the size of the, of, of the filters. And the interesting thing was that, <coughs> excuse me, Again, not very surprising in retrospect is that the continent works better with the smaller sizes, so with, with, with small patches, whereas the sim net works better with larger patches. And this is not surprising because since the continent has to look at the, the rotation as translations, it, it really wants to deal with small ones because small translations can pass off for, for translations. But if you're detecting trans, if you're actually detecting rotations, now you can actually recognize right away larger features because you can actually now rotate them. And it makes sense to rotate them. Okay. Alright, so next steps, obviously more layers combined with richer distortions. The point of having more layers is that when the, the image plane is not all just being distorted by one of my transformation, but I have richer things going on, I can still recognize them. Okay? And and of course once we have more layers and richer distortions working with things like canvas digits, the next thing, of course, is to apply this to real-world images. Things like ImageNet and so on. And also, you know, we want to develop a sub-product network version of, 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 uh, of, of SIMNETs because that will give us two things. It will allow us to combine symmetry with part decomposition. Right? What you typically have in an image is not just the symmetry of the whole image, it's symmetries of parts of it. You know, there's a bird flying in front of the forest, and the transformations that the bird is undergoing are different from the forest. And the transformations that the wings are undergoing are different from the transformations of the bird and so on. And, 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 and an SPN will give us the power to, to, to learn and, 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 and reason with that. Also, it'll give us, it gives us the power to combine bottom-up and top-down inference, which again, I think is very important. Right? You need to find what your parts are by going up, but in order to do it, you need to find your best matches of all your image patches to different parts. And then in your larger context, you need to go and revisit your we would like to incorporate other symmetries, starting with no ones like lighting, but eventually just letting the system learn whatever symmetries happen to be present in the, uh, in the input. And if you have suggestions uh, of things to do, I would be very interested to hear them. Okay. All right. Uh, this is interesting, but perhaps not super surprising so far. It maybe will be a new, a better kind of, 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 of deep network for some tasks but so far it's not terribly different from things that we already know. Uh, let me uh, give you a completely different example that I hope will illustrate uh, you know, how general and potentially powerful these ideas are. And this is the example of semantic parsing. Okay. So the goal in semantic parsing is to map sentences to logical formulas. Okay. So you give me English, and then I give you logical formulas, and now you can reason over those formulas using you know, uh, uh, logical inference and uh, answer questions, have a natural language interface to your robot, you know, tell your robot, hey, go fetch my you know, stapler from, uh, you know, from the office and so forth. Okay. So semantic parsing is a structured prediction task. Right? The thing that we're trying to output is not just a simple class, but it's a whole meaning structure. <coughs> it's still a kind of classification problem, one where now the set of classes is extremely large and has a lot of structure. 
And you know, there's been, you know, in NLP, right, people used to be just do semantics. The, sorry, syntax. These days, there's more and more interest in semantics. And, and you know, and the heart of it is semantic parsing. But the problem with semantic parsing, but there are two very big problems with, with, with semantic parsing. The first one is that no one can agree on what that, you know, amazing formal representation should be. Okay? The second one is that it's very hard to get labeled data. You need someone to take a sentence in English and transform it into a logical formula. How many people can do that, right? This is never going to scale. Well, if we use ideas from symmetry group theory, we can actually change this problem into one that is much, much easier to solve. As follows. A let's think of a symmetry of a sentence as being a syntactic transformation that preserves its meaning. Okay? The function that we are now trying to conserve is the meaning of the sentence. And the symmetries are syntactic transformations. Things like you know, synonyms, paraphrases, active, passive voice, composing sentences from different pieces. Okay? And they can be composed and they satisfy the group accent. So for example, you might have sentences like, Bill wore shades. William donned sunglasses, sunglasses were done by William, and the question, <coughs> were shades done by Bill? If I have learned those symmetries from the data, like, you know, Bill and William, you know, mean the same thing, and Warren Don, and active passive, then I can compose them to actually recognize a sentence that I have never seen before as meaning the same as some of the sentences that I have seen before. Okay. So that's the general idea. So one more notion from the theory, the notion of orbit. The orbit of an object under a symmetry group is the set of all objects that it can be mapped to by the symmetry. By, by, sorry, by symmetries in the group. Excuse me. <coughs> and it's easy to see that the orbits of the objects in a set partition the set. Okay? If A is in the same orbit as B and B is in the same orbit as C, then A is in the same orbit as C, and those guys are all the same orbit. But you can't jump from one orbit to the other. And therefore, it's easy to see that if we define uh, you know, symmetries of a sentence as, 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 as meaning-preserving transformations, then there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the orbits of the sentences and the meanings of the sentences, which means that we never have to explicitly represent the meaning of the sentence. That problem goes away. We don't need to agree on a formal meaning representation, and our training data Instead of being pairs of English and, and logic, they can just be pairs of English and English, which, of course, any Turk can provide, and this is an experiment that we are currently setting up. Okay? And the orbits, right, we can put probability distributions on the orbits, because, of course, these things, you know, are not going to happen with certainty. Language is ambiguous and whatnot. But because the orbits have very rich compositional structure, right, I have synonym, a synonym for the, you know, noun, a synonym for the verb, you know, and then, you know, um, and transformations among, among larger units, but we can put probability distributions on them that are efficiently computable, taking advantage of that structure. So here's our symmetry-based semantic parser, as we have it so far. So the goal is just to find the most probable orbit of a sentence. And if I know the most probable orbit of a sentence, I know, I know as much of its meaning as I can and, and, and need to know. Okay? Effectively, what this is going to mean is that when I'm given a new sentence, I want to map it to a known sentence by composing known symmetries. Okay? If I fail to do that, then what that means is that this is a new sentence and therefore you know, this is a new meaning. Right? It's a sentence with a new meaning, not just you know, an old meaning under a new guise. And therefore, I need to create a new orbit. Okay? And as I said, we can, we can do this. Not only can we represent this efficiently using the compositional structure of the orbits, we can also find the most probable orbit efficiently. And the process is really very analogous to inference in some part of networks, where the uni a union of orbits leads to a sum, but I'm going to have a distribution over the, over the you know, a subsets in the union, and the, the Cartesian product of orbits leads to a product. The Cartesian product of orbits happens, for example, when I have the synonyms for the subject, doing a Cartesian product with the synonyms for the verb, with the Cartesian, uh, sorry, Cartesian product with the synonyms for the uh, uh, um, you know, for the object, okay? And the union, of course, for example, when I have, well, on the one side I have sentences in the active voice, on the other hand, on the side I have sentences in the passive voice, and so on. Well, so, now how do we learn, right? So, we, we've just defined semantic parsing in a new way that avoids the problems that people had before, but now we need to learn our semantic parsing. So the goal of learning, actually, is not very simple. It's just to discover the symmetries of the language. The semantics of the language is represented by a symmetry group, and our goal is to discover that symmetry group. Okay? 
And our data can be for it could be unsupervised, but but you know the obvious thing is to have pairs of sentences with the same meaning, right? You said like, oh, you know, this sentence means the same as this sentence. How can I induce from these two sentences what things are paraphrases and, and so on and so forth? Okay? The structure that we're trying to learn is actually not just any symmetries, but hopefully a minimal generating set. Okay? I want to find symmetries, like for example, synonyms of individual words that I can then compose into very complicated symmetries of whole sentences. The parameters are the orbit probabilities. My initial state of my search can just be the known symmetries. So I can initialize with the symmetries that I know and then go from there or start from zero. And the operators will be to fill gaps in derivations and refactor things and I can score it you know, uh, by things like the penalized language. So I'm out of time. Let me just mention that we have already, we also have some preliminary experiments here that show the benefits of, of doing this over a more classic type of, of semantic parsing. Um, I have one more thought here about, um, well, at the end of the day, the goal is to reason, right? And it, it would seem that just identifying the orbits of sentences doesn't let us then reason with them. But let me just make one observation, which is logical inference rules are really just symmetries of knowledge bases. Because what they do is they add sentences to the knowledge base without changing the meaning of the knowledge base, right? That's the whole point. And the meaning of the knowledge base is very precisely defined, right? It's the set of worlds that, that the knowledge base is, is consistent with. So for example, we can think of modus ponens as a symmetry of a set of sentences. I, I have these two sentences, Socrates is a human and all humans are mortal, and I can add this sentence, right, which is a syntactic transformation, I say that Socrates is mortal, but the meaning of the knowledge base did not change at all. So hopefully we can also uh, uh, fold the logical inference process itself into this uh, symmetry group framework. All right, let me summarize uh, in just two sentences. It's surprising that symmetry group theory has not played a larger role in machine learning to date. Uh, we might even speculate that symmetry group theory uh, should be one of the foundational areas of machine learning, along with probability, logic, and optimization. The reason, perhaps, why it hasn't made a bigger impact so far is that on its own, it doesn't solve the problem. You need to combine it with things like probability and logic and optimization. And what we saw in this talk was the beginnings of how, perhaps, to do that. Thank you. There isn't that much paraphrased data, but there's a lot of machine translation data that seems to be appropriate to this. Yeah, again, this could be, we started by applying it to semantic parsing because it's something we've been working on, but machine translation is another obvious, right? There's, every parallel corpus is a source of data for something like this. Yeah. Also, another interesting one is there's a lot of work now on connecting language and vision, right? And you can think of, you know, so what happens is that the images of an object are an orbit, right? The, the, the sentences that describe the object are another orbit, but now you can actually have, as soon as you understand the mapping from one element to another, you can actually do the mappings from one element, so on, and so on. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention that uh, it's possible to do uh, And again, you know, like, let me let me say again that there have been, you know, to date, you know, applications of, 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 of symmetry uh, in learning. Like, for example, Stefan Malat's theory of deep networks employs a lot of concepts of symmetry, right? So it's not we're not suggesting by any means that you know, like this is completely new. But you know, what we're suggesting is that you know it can be taken farther than it has so far. And you know, I think some of the people in this room are and, and, and will be doing that. Yeah. So uh, s strong symmetry between two data points basically make them collapse into one. Right? Mm -hmm. The information between the, that th those are two different data points just goes away and, and can be abstracted from the model. And once it goes away, it, it is gone. Right? You cannot recover any information about it. What are your thoughts about um, 
basically realizing that there is such symmetries or such invariance in the model, but still being able to express through the model that those two entities are right, connected. Right, so, so two things, right? The first one is that when a group of symmetries acts on a set, what it actually does is a permutation of a set. It maps A to B and it maps B to something else, potentially A, right? So symmetry, strictly speaking, does not lose information. However, I would submit that actually what we want is to lose information, which is why it's a good idea to intersperse symmetries with feature detectors. At the end of the day, what we want to do is map our, 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 our objects that are in many, many, many different sets into just as few sets as there are classes. This, for example, in the case of classification, at least, right? So we want to apply symmetries, but we also want to, at the same time to do this kind of reduction of the space because eventually that's what we want to have is to very clearly separate sets, which is, for example, like the positive examples one on site and the negative ones on another. Okay, well, one last question. So the symmetry you talk about, the way you define the really just invariant one, you have an invariant you know, transformation you know, there. In real, in any pattern like in problem, Invariant is just only half the story. Sometimes you, actually more often, you would like that invariant to be valid a little bit, no matter how much it is, as long as discrimination in the final task can be done. So there is a notion of a fuzzy type of invariance in the symmetry, so that you, should, you know the good uh, recognition system should be able to allow, as long as it doesn't really confuse no, exactly, the concept. Exactly. So Does that concept built get built into this symmetry? Yes. So so I think again, this is I think part of why symmetry. You know, but there hasn't been used that much is that invariants are never perfect. But what we're trying to do here is actually to have imperfect invariants by either having, for example, probability distributions over the orbits, right? So now you can, if you're invariant with more or less probability, or by optimizing the function like, like we had in the, in the CMEX, that, you know, I'm trying to optimize discrimination, and I need to find whatever amount of invariance imperfect or partial as, as serves that goal. So you're absolutely right, it's the combination of the things that that's done. All right, let's uh, thank Pedro for this very